Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Monday, it was Asteroid Day. I was off in Arizona giving talks at Meteor Crater and the Lowell Observatory about, you know, asteroids and other small solar system objects. And somebody in the audience asked me about Oumuamua, the small interstellar comet that came through our solar system and disappeared off into deep space. Now, they were interested in things like, is it an alien spaceship? Uh, I wasn't going to go there, but I did say that with things like Vera Rubin coming online, we were only going to start seeing more interstellar objects. We'd already found two, Oumuamua and Comet Borisov. But I did not expect that literally the next day we would see the announcement of the discovery of a third interstellar object, originally known as A11PL3Z. It's now known as Comet 3I slash Atlas. And Atlas is for the telescope that discovered it. So this is the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, a network of four half-meter telescopes run by the University of Hawaii. There's two in Hawaii, one at Haleakala and another on Mauna Kea. Then there's one in Chile and one in South Africa. And I believe it was one in Chile which got the first images of this. So they began plotting an orbit on it and they said, this is crazy. This has a an eccentricity which is really negative. Like some of the information made it look like its eccentricity was as low as minus 10. But now, you know, it looks more like it's minus 6.15. But Basically, the thing about eccentricity is if you've got a closed orbit, then the, if you've got a circular orbit, it's zero. If it's an eccentric orbit, an elliptical orbit, then it gets higher. And as the ex, uh, the orbit gets you know, really, really eccentric and becomes a parabolic orbit, it actually goes through infinity and comes out at negative infinity. This is just like a mathematical thing. But yeah, these uh, highly eccentric orbits are interstellar objects. They're coming through in a hyperbolic trajectory. They're going to fly past for the next few months uh, and then disappear off into deep space. Now, modeling this orbit shows that at perihelion, it's expected it may reach speeds of as much as 68 kilometers per second. Now, the Earth's escape velocity, or the escape velocity from where the Earth is, about, it's about 42 kilometers per second. So this is significantly faster. It's going to come inside Mars's orbit and then again disappear off into deep space. And unfortunately, because of the way the orbits are lined up, Earth is pretty much going to be on the opposite side of the Sun when that happens. So, yeah, wh whatever. Now, the what's really important for these hyperbolic objects is what we call the velocity at infinity. That is, the speed that is left over after it's done climbing out of the sun's gravity well. So it's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. And then eventually it's so far away that the sun is no longer affecting its velocity. At that point, we think it'll be going about 58 kilometers per second. Now, com for comparison, Oumuamua, its excess velocity, infinite excess velocity, is about 26 kilometers per second. So this thing is really motoring. <laughs> I looked at the positions and it looks like it came from roughly the direction of the constellation of Sagittarius, which as you know is roughly pointing towards the center of the galaxy. So this object is coming from interior to the sun's orbit around the galaxy and shooting outwards. And you might think, wow, 56 kilometers per second, that surely is motoring at great speed and will shoot off you know, beyond the edge of the galaxy. That's that's not true. If you add, so the sun, uh, the sun is moving around the galaxy at about 250 kilometers per second. And if you add in like the perpendicular component and you do a little Pythagoras triangle, this thing is maybe moving five or six kilometers per second faster than the sun. Now that is a quick back of the envelope calculation. There will be no doubt people that will trace this backwards through space and time to figure out if it came from any particular direction that's interesting or it's going to any interesting direction. So, yeah, as I said, it's going to fly through. The Earth is moving out the way. A lot of questions are then asked. Um, could we have sent a space probe to this thing? Well, obviously, we haven't found it until now, but there was a project from the European Space Agency called Comet Interceptor. And the idea is this is an object, a spacecraft, which would sit at, uh, I believe, the L2 point on the far side of the Earth's sun, right? And it would just hang around there until a suitable high energy comet was found. And then it would fire its engine, swing by the Earth to get a gravity assist, and be, it would be basically ready to go to intercept any interesting comet. Now, I did a quick look at the orbit for this. Even if this project was flying and it's not ready yet, it, the Earth is in the wrong position. So 
they're a little early in this one, but with again, with Vera Rubin coming online, it's very likely we get to see more of these things. So with that, it means if he did want to try to catch up well, to, to intercept this thing to get close, because we're not really going to get any spacecraft close enough to do anything, um, we would have to ch we'd have to try to chase it down, and that would require huge amounts of velocity. Which brings me sort of to the second half of this video. You see, I do my deep space questions, taking questions from Patreon, uh, you know, supporters, people that pay me to like talk stuff about spaceflight. So uh, we have a question from Drew Granston who says, are there any possible mission profiles for probes to extrasolar objects like Oumuamua? The trajectory from Earth would require a large delta V as Oumuamua is moving through our solar system at high velocity. Missions might be flyby, orbit impact, and plume analysis, soft landing, sample return, etc. And I'm mostly interested in what does it take to send a spacecraft to one of these hyperbolic interstellar objects. And so if we just take a look at the hyperbolic excess velocity of Oumuamua, it's 26 kilometers per second. How big a spacecraft do you actually need to get to that? Well, uh, you know, if you if you build a rocket out of hydrogen propellant and you have optimal mass, you know, stage mass ratios, uh, with each stage maybe being six or seven times the mass of previous ones, you can barely get up to Oumuamua's 26 kilometers per second with a four-stage rocket fueled by liquid hydrogen and the best engines we have. But that is sort of not the correct answer because that is the excess velocity infinity, as we say. And what you got to, the way you think about excess velocity of at infinity is it's the amount of kinetic left en energy left over after you climb out of the potential energy well of the, the sun. So if your escape velocity is, say, 10, uh, say 42 kilometers per second, and you're moving at uh, 10 kilometers per second at infinity, you take the square of the 10 and the square of the 42 and you know you add those together and that gives you the velocity that you would be at at the uh, as you are passing the earth's orbit and so the the excess velocity is what you've got look you're just that it's just it's just squares because it's kinetic energy you're adding squares and you either have to subtract or whatever and take square roots but it turns out that since you are already moving at 30 kilometers per second right to get up to escape velocity, you only need to add 12.4 kilometers per second. So, okay, so you need to add that to your 26 kilometers per second. Not quite, right? If you take the square root, or the, sorry, if you square 26 kilometers per second, and then you add that to 42 kilometers per second, square that, and then take the square root, it says you need to be moving at 49.73 kilometers per second to catch up to Oumuamua. And that actually... Is, is slightly better because it means that you're only having to get 19 kilometers per second over the speed of the Earth orbiting the Sun because you're taking advantage of the fact that the Earth is already moving. So you can actually get away with a smaller one. Now, how about taking a look at getting to Atlas? Well, Atlas is interesting because it's going a whole lot faster. And I figured out you would need like a six or seven stage pure hydrogen rocket. And... For even a small space probe, you're talking a spacecraft that's about half a million tons in orbit, right? So we'd have to get that much hardware into orbit to launch like a one ton spacecraft to, <laughs> to catch up with this thing. The next problem is that if you're, sending two, if you're sending a spacecraft out to intercept this object, then you want it to be intercepted at a point where there's still enough sunlight to do something useful. But the closer in you intercept, the sharper your intercept angle and the faster you're going to encounter it. So if you encounter something, uh, so the Earth is going to be about 2 AU away from the ideal orbit. That means if you're intercepting it, say, at 60 AU, you're going to be crossing this thing at around 2 degrees. You're going to be crossing the orbit at uh, several kilometers per second. So you might want to have excess propellant available once you get there to slow down so that you're not flying past it too much. Uh, and that, so that does not even include <laughs> intercepting and getting into a direct orbit. Uh, now, you can try other types of technologies. Nuclear thermal, that's a possibility. But the design with nuclear thermal is slightly different because 
uh, instead of having multiple rocket stages, well, you do have multiple rocket stages, right, for different uh, ideal perf thrusts, but with nuclear thermal, the engine typically can burn for a lot more than a single tank of gas with designs. They're usually designed for like ferry spacecraft that go back and forth multiple times. Uh, but you can just have lots of drop tanks that this thing starts out moving very slowly and accelerating very slowly and it just burns through all this propellant until all of the nuclear fuel in this rocket is spent. So these things can use a slightly smaller object, but you're still talking launching something like a Saturn V into orbit <laughs> to actually catch something of this size. Electrical propulsion systems, sure, those get much, much higher specific impulses, so you need a lot less propellant. The problem then is that there are no reactors that work in deep space. Nuclear electric propulsion uh, is the only option when you're going out that far, because once you get beyond Jupiter's orbit, you simply need solar panels that are just far too large. So it would need to be a nuclear electric propulsion system. And then you have the problem that all the nuclear uh, engine on the nuclear uh, reactors have been designed. You know, Krusty, the kilopower for lunar exploration. Those are designed to maintain like one kilowatt of power for 10 years, which doesn't actually turn out to a whole lot of power. If you take one kilowatt for one year and you use the best ion thruster, then you barely get the same speed as chemical engines because these reactors, they're not designed for efficient and complete burn up of the propellant of the, the nuclear fuel. They're designed to be provide stable power for a long period of time rather than lots of power for a couple of months as you accelerate up to speed. So getting to these things is extraordinarily hard and that is why we have the Comet Interceptor, right? Which the idea is it's going to sit just beyond the Earth and it'll have a propulsion system that will enable it to drop back down to Earth and that just fly by of the Earth gives them all sorts of options for how they get kicked back out to intercept their target. But if you're taking advantage of, uh, you know, of, of gravity, you can do what's called a flyby, right? We all know about flybys. You fly by Jupiter and it kicks you off into higher velocity orbits. Well, that's great. Jupiter doesn't have quite the amount of gravity you need. There's another way to do this, which we call a flyby. And the idea is that if you fly past the sun when you're at perihelion and if you fire your engines, you're adding much more energy to your system. Remember I said the hyperbolic excess velocity is basically the kinetic energy at infinity minus the gravity potential? Well, if you're moving at say 100 kilometers per second and you add one kilometer per second to your velocity, then you're getting much more energy than if you were moving at 10 kilometers per second and add one kilometer per second. Because again, it's kinetic energy and it squares. So the idea is, you build a spacecraft that flies down close to the sun where the escape velocity from the sun gets up to 600 kilometers per second if you're willing to go get really, really toasty. I mean, more toasty than uh, the Parker Solar Probe, which gets up to about 200 kilometers per second. So, for example, if you are flying at 100 kilometers per second relative to the sun and you add one kilometer per second, that gets you 14 kilometers per second at infinity. See, it's magic. You add two, that gets you to 20. Three kilometers per second, add you, gets you to 24.7. And four, adding four kilometers per second, which is something you can do with a pretty small solid rocket motor, would get you to 28.6. So you could, in theory, intercept Oumuamua. It becomes harder and harder to do this for something like Comet Atlas 3, uh, 3i. So the next hard part of this is that to get to the sun, it takes a huge amount of kinetic amount of thrust and kinetic energy to go directly from the Earth. Instead, what you the best way to do this is you fly out, you send your spacecraft out to Jupiter originally, and then Jupiter swings the orbit around, kicks it down, drops the perihelion, so you swing past the sun in the correct orientation, and then you light your engines, just like in Star Trek IV, where they're time traveling. When this stuff hits 88 kilometers per second, you're going to see some serious... Yeah. <laughs> you ever noticed, by the way, that um, the captain of the Klingon Bird of Prey is played by uh, Christopher Lloyd, uh, who also is Doc Brown. So he built, he's built uh, had two time-traveling vehicles in movie history, although he didn't fly one of them. Sorry, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, spaceships. 
So yeah, you you know, you do this, it takes several years to kick out and another few years to come back. So this is the kind of thing you have to have planned <laughs> and it has to be going in the right direction at the right time if you're going to make this work. Uh, and then, of course, you do have the problem of how do you have a spacecraft which survives when it's literally skimming the surface of the sun so that you can get that 60 kilometers per second to chase after Comet Atlas. So yeah, for any mission that wants to go to an interstellar object, you basically got three extremes. You have extreme heavy lift to launch something into space that can actually generate the excess velocity needed to catch this up. You have extreme uh, thermal control where you build something that can fly through the sun very, very close, light its engine, and then yeet off into deep space with ridiculous velocities. And then there's just extremely good luck of having a comet interceptor mission in position, ready to go, and having an object come through the solar system with exactly the right kind of orbit during your mission so that you can actually catch up with it before it disappears off into deep space. And I think that third one is the best option. We should have these kind of comet interceptors just stationed, ready to go, so that we can take advantage of Don't have them just around the, the Earth. Have one sitting near Venus as well. It has a Lagrange point. Have one up near Jupiter. I don't know. Ideas. They, this would be cool. I would love to get a close look at some of these really interesting, radical objects as they fly through space. But for the next few months, we will be paying a lot of attention to Atlas as it well, swings by. It's actually going the wrong direction, incidentally, as well. If you look at the orbit, uh, it flies inside Mars's orbit, but its velocity relative to Mars will be absolutely ridiculous. It's because it's going in the wrong direction. So yes, interstellar. It's a real thing. It's really extreme. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.